Hi everybody, welcome back to the Old Warlock. I'm Alex. I'm Jim. And today we're going to have a little bit of a departure from our usual sort of content. Those of you who have been with us for a, for a while know that we like to stay with the lighthearted side of things. We like to talk about the aspects of Dungeons and Dragons and board games and whatever else we may enjoy and we may like playing, things like that. Uh, but, today, but today we are, while sticking with the theme of Dungeons and Dragons, we're going to talk about something a little bit more serious and that's something that some of you may recognize from the Stranger Things seasons that have come out recently. There's been a lot of talk about the satanic panic, uh, which was, you know, a big kind of protest movement almost to, to games like Dungeons and Dragons, as well as rock and roll, uh, certain movies, a lot of different yeah. things like that, that arose stuff, in yeah. the 1970s <clears throat> into the 80s. And uh, we thought that we would take a, a little bit of a closer look at that, uh, just, just for you guys, some of the history of it, because it's definitely applicable to some of the things we talk about. But... We want to say before we get started uh, that, again, this is going to be kind of a departure from some of our usual content. We know that some of you like to watch our videos with your kids, uh, with your families, things like that, and we love that. But just due to some of the subject matter today, um, we would maybe recommend that you don't do that. This is maybe, or, or, this you, or you check it first. Yeah, check it first. Before you show this it. is a little bit more sensitive subject matter with with some more unpleasant themes, um, just because of some of the things that they're talking about. So yeah, yeah, just to, just be conscious. Yeah, and, of and we'll that be, we'll be going forward. back to our normal fare, but we thought this was an interesting subject. Um, just based on some of the things that are happening in pop culture right now. So. And a very, it's a very important part of Dungeons & Dragons and gaming history, so it we is. want to give you guys kind of a background on it. So, we'll get started. We will! Back in the 1980s, again, we're, we'll, we'll start off with the relationship to... Stranger Things Season 4. If any of you are watching Stranger Things Season 4, which we have and we really enjoy it, mm -hmm. uh, you'll notice that there is a reference, there, there actually quite a bit of the referencing in that series, that particular um, fourth season of the series. It revolves around a real antagonistic approach to Dungeons & Dragons. In fact, I'd say that's one of the primary drivers for a lot of the characters in the show. For some of the conflict. For a lot of the conflict that, that, that's actually happening is this real fear of Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm not going to get into the details of, of how that's shown in the film mm -hmm. or in the movies or in the series. Uh, you can find that out for yourselves. But is there anything that's actually real behind all that? I mean, how deep did the, the worry about Dungeons and Dragons being, re being related to Satanism, how, far, how deep did that go? A lot of people believe that the Satanic Panic was largely revolving around Dungeons and Dragons. It wasn't. The Satanic Panic was something that American society had kind of been primed for going clear back to the 1960s. And it just so happened that by the 1980s, especially the early 1980s, um, people that, that fear of the occult and the fear of demonic possession, those kinds of things, that was starting to hit a rise, but D&D &D was also starting to come into its own at about that time. And through a bizarre set of circumstances, coincidences actually, Dungeons and Dragons became one of the focal points for at least some of the people who were trying to raise the cry and alarm of um, satanic influences that were, that were sweeping across the nation. Everybody believed that there were satanic influences behind every, uh, around every corner, behind every bush, underneath every rock. And D&D &D was just kind of swept up into that. Now, the Satanic Panic kind of got its start clear back in the 1960s. There were a series of murders that took place. The most, uh, the most easily remembered ones are the Charles Manson killings. Um, that was done by... The death of Sharon Tate, people right. like that. Exactly. And there were a lot of people who believed that that was actually a cult-related killing. Well, it was the killings were done by a cult, the cult of Charles Manson, they left some things scribbled on walls. There were some, some bizarre sayings that they, they uh, left behind when they, when they committed their murders. But it wasn't that the, the murders actually had a ritualistic connotation or, or, or actually tied into the occult necessarily. But that kind of got people primed for thinking that, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is something brand new. You mean there are cults out there that are, that are killing people? What the heck's up with this? Well, that combined with the release of several different movies. There was Rosemary's Baby. I want to say that that was in 1968, 69. Um, there was The Exorcist, which came out in 1973, which was about demonic possession. Uh, there was The Omen series, which came out, I want to say, in the mid-70s to late 70s. All of those things were starting to prime Americans to really be fearful of the occult. Uh, 
So it's not like the whole satanic panic thing started in 1981. It didn't. It got its start clear back in the, in the late 1960s. And this is kind of, I would, I'll say that this is kind of a, it's mirrored by the rise of counterculture movements in the United States, yes. starting in the, in the 1960s. With yes. Protests, the Vietnam War, um, you know, all that kind of push back against what you could call traditionalism in America. There's this rise of counterculture. And I think this is, in a lot of ways, that traditional culture's way of pushing back against that. It's, it's, it's an explanation, right. I, I, I think opposition exactly. to that taking place. And so it yeah. all ties into each other with just these different cultural movements that are going on in America. They're all tied in together. And I think that the traditional movement, the, the you know, the, the more traditionally um, 1953-esque. Leave it to Beaver. Right. I think that those people, they were the ones who really started to see a lot of fear, or they started to experience a lot of fear that things were changing out of control. Not in a, not in a, in a normal evolutionary manner, but they were changing quickly and out of control. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, was, that was just reflected in the pop culture as well. Anyway, as far as D&D &D was concerned, it just kind of was suddenly there while all of this, this um, counterculture... Um, fear-mongering, if you will. I mean, it wasn't intended that way, but that was what was happening because of these movies and, and, and things you're reading in the paper. D&D was just suddenly on the scene when all this was already starting to happen. So D&D first started to get swept up in the satanic panic with the disappearance of a young man named James Dallas Egbert III in 1979. He went off to uh, Michigan State University at the age of 16 to study computer science, I believe it was. And after he had been there a little while, he disappeared. And no one had any idea where he was. And keep in mind, this is in analog days where you couldn't just text somebody and find out where they were. He didn't have a cell phone because there were no cell phones. So if you wanted to disappear for a while and you just got into a car and drove off, you could disappear for quite some time. Well, his family was pretty upset about this. They hired a detective by the name of William Deere out of Texas. And William Deere went up to Michigan State University and started to investigate the dis disappearance of this young man. Well, he found out in the course of his investigation that James Dallas Egbert played Dungeons and Dragons. And that he also, apparently, uh, took part in group Dungeons and Dragons cosplay, if you will, by going into the steam tunnels underneath Michigan State University campus dressed up as wizards or warriors, and then they would have a dungeon master who would set up things that you could go and do in these in these tunnels underneath the campus. Which, I'm going to be honest with you, sounds kind of kind of fun. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I would have done it if yeah. I had known that something like, hap like, like that was happening at my university, mm -hmm. I would have been there. Mm -hmm. But um, William Deere got it into his head, rightly or wrongly, that somehow, well, and when he was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons, people kept telling him, this is a game that you play with your mind. Now keep in mind, the vast, vast majority of people had no idea what Dungeons and Dragons was at that time. And so when William Deere started he hearing about this, he started to think, well, um, there must be some tie with this game, that, this mind game that highly intellectual people play. It's got to be tied into this somehow. Now, I think he really jumped to some conclusions on this, but that's, not, that's neither here nor there. This is just what happened. So Deere ended up coming up with the theory that uh, James Dallas Egbert was lost in the steam tunnels under Michigan State University. He had either lost his mind playing the game and had wandered into the tunnels believing that he was a wizard or a warrior or whatever character it was he played, and that he had either been injured or he was dead in those tunnels. Well, of course, that led to, um, when he started to publicize this and say, you know, this is the person we're looking for, well, when you have headlines that can read things such as um, mind game leads child to disappear in tunnels, that's going to sell newspapers. Mm -hmm. So across the nation, as soon as this story started to appear um, on the tickers, the newspapers were picking this up everywhere. And so you started to have all kinds of really bizarre headlines that were appearing saying that this Dungeon, Dungeons & Dragons was a cult-like game, that it was something that could cause you to lose your mind because they were just feeding off of what Deere was telling them. Well, it ended up that James Dallas Egbert was not dead. He was not hurt. He was just having some um, life issues, if you will. And he got a little bit tired of having to deal with them at Michigan State University, and so he went down to live with some friends in Louisiana. 
And he found out that there was this big search going on for him by reading about these things in the newspaper. Well, he ended up making a phone call and said, no, I'm down here in Louisiana. And they found, uh, even William Deere found out, okay, after talking to James Dallas Egbert, he ended up finding out that Dungeons & Dragons really wasn't tied into his disappearance at all. But when he actually made a retraction and said, you know, this, this game thing, that, that's really no, that has nothing to do with it, do you think the newspapers went out and actually printed retractions linking Dungeons & Dragons to this disappearance of this young man? Some of them did on page 470 at the bottom of the page, you know, bottom left in a two-sentence retraction, but the vast majority of them did not. The damage was done. The damage was done, and the important part here, um, and when you say the damage was done, that's exactly what it was. What you ended up having was the entire nation's initial introduction to Dungeons and Dragons was through the James Dallas Egbert case. And all they could remember was that you could lose your mind, it was something that was cult-like, and you could end up getting yourself killed over it. So that's the setting that led to Dungeons & Dragons being a part of the Satanic Panic. Well, after this was all said and done, um, and I believe it was 1980, there was enough hysteria about Dungeons & Dragons for Heber City, Utah to actually outlaw the game in its local school, in its local school system, uh, claiming that it led to, that Dungeons & Dragons uh, would lead to Satanism, as well as, um, what was it? Communist subversion. Um, and, you, and from 1980 on, you started to see a lot of school districts saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, maybe we're going, to be in, we're going to be having some problems here if we allow our children or students to play Dungeons and Dragons. So you started to see it be more and more outlawed, if you will, from school districts across the United States. Now, there was a movie that came out starring Tom Hanks based on a novel by uh, Rona Jaffe that linked the whole James Dallas Egbert case. It brought the James Dallas Egbert case more into the mainstream, even more into the mainstream. And then people started to take more cues from popular culture about what Dungeons and Dragons could do to you. If you get the chance, uh, look up Arona Jaffe. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, Mazes and Monsters, I think, is, was the name of the, of the movie. You I can still so. see it. Yeah. Um, but take a look at that, and that'll give you some idea of the, of the way that people were being introduced to the game of Dungeons and Dragons in around 1979, 1980, 1981. Um, but in 1981, however, um, there was another young man who took his life and his name was Irving Pulling and in the search in his mother's search to try and find a reason for his son to or her son to have taken his own life she turned to Dungeons and Dragons now she was one of these people that I'm sure had been exposed whose initial exposure to Dungeons and Dragons had been through all of the mass media hysteria about the James Dallas Egbert case and when she found some Dungeons & Dragons materials in her son's possessions after, his, um, after he took his own life, she became 100% convinced that it was the D&D material that caused her son uh, to commit suicide. Now, it is a, apparently th there's some evidence that suggests that Irving Pulling only played Dungeons & Dragons two or three times, uh, prior to taking his own life, and looking back on it, and t after uh, people later on talking to uh, late, after people later on talked to his friends, talked to his friends later on, um, they found that he was a very troubled young man to begin with. But according to um, Patricia Pulling, the boy's mother, she claimed that Irving Pulling took his own life after playing a game of D and D in his local school, and I think it was either a counselor or a principal who was the dungeon master. I think it was a counselor. I think, I, I think it was, but I, I just don't remember. And you can, you can Google this and you can find yeah. out a lot more information about it. But um, she claimed that because the DM put a curse on her son, that was something that he couldn't cope with, and that was the reason that he took his own life. Well, uh, Patricia Pulling tried to take TSR and the school district to court and blame them for her son's suicide. And it was thrown out of court, but that didn't stop Patricia Pulling, and she ended up forming an organization called BADD, B-A-D-D. Uh, that was the acronym for uh, Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons. And she went on a national campaign to basically tear Dungeons and Dragons down. 
And I'll throw this up on the screen. This is one of her pamphlets that she, that she had um, that she distributed to school districts and she distributed it to law enforcement. And she ended up coming, putting herself across as being an expert in the occult. And how that exactly happened, you know, I, I don't know. She didn't have any real training in this. Didn't she only have a degree in music? I think it was music or, or something art like or something that. like that. Yeah. She had like an associate's yeah. degree in music or art. But so she was not an expert. She was not an expert in the occult. She was not an expert in sociology or psychology. But she did align herself with some people who had, who ostensibly were experts in psychology mm -hmm. and sociology. One of them was a man by the name of Thomas Radeke. Thomas Radeke, Dr. Thomas Radeke, was a psychologist or psychiatrist. I want to say he was a psychologist who was the chairman of the, um, uh, what was it? National Coalition on Television Violence. And Thomas... Again, all tied in together. Yes. And Thomas Radeke was a person who firmly believed that Dungeons & Dragons was responsible for violent behavior across the United States. And we'll get back to Thomas Radeke in a minute. But... Um, Pat Pulling ended up tying a lot of very obscure allies, bringing a lot of very obscure allies into, into BAD to give her organization some element of credibility. The thing was, it really didn't need a lot of credibility because, again, America had already been primed with this fear of the occult, with this fear of demonic possession, and she was just feeding more into an already existing situation and basically making it worse. Because again, I think absolutely crucial to understanding this is that the paradigm and the understanding of Dungeons and Dragons was just non-existent. Right. Nobody had heard of it right. before. Like, because, you know, today you go out, it's, the books are sold, are sold in Barnes and Noble. It's everywhere. They play it on the Big Bang Theory. It's, it's, it's this normalization of nerd culture. It's something that's very mainstream now and people have a lot of exposure to it. So it's less scary. Um, but people had, again, no clue what any of this was. Right. And having this put alongside, again, weird rock music that was new. And people like Led Zeppelin, ACDC, bands that people hadn't heard of. It's all just this this rise of things. People who were generally, I would say, a little on the older side, maybe not accustomed to, and it was a break in tradition. It was confusing. So they latched onto things that they were scared of because it's, you know, it's groupthink. That's how these things work. Well, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm in no way defending the actions of Pat Pulling or any of the people who are trying to bring Dungeons and Dragons down. But as a parent, you yeah. know, if, there, if there's a threat out there, you are going to do whatever you can to protect your child from it. Especially initially. Right. And when these terrible things happen, you'll search for an explanation and you might latch on to something like that. Right. But to give, to put it even more in context, because of all of the things that were leading up to the 1980s that led to this fear of the occult, I can remember myself, um, in the 1980s, there was one statistic that said, and I remember reading this in a newspaper, that 50,000 children were, kid were being kidnapped every year uh, by strangers. And ostensibly, they were being kidnapped to be used in satanic rituals or some sort of ritual occult activity. In actuality, it was about 100 children a year, which is the number still you find today, r roughly the same number you find today. About 100 children a year were actually being kidnapped by strangers back in the 1980s. But all it took was one news media outlet or one person like Pat Pulling to get news media coverage to say this and suddenly it's everywhere and it becomes fact. That's why you need to cite things. Check your sources and everything you read. But exactly. Like well, and, and, a, and to kind of go along with that, Dr. Thomas Radeke, the person that we mentioned as being one of Pat Pulling's allies, um, he came up with a statistic that stated that more that you if, if you play Dungeons and Dragons, you were more likely to... Uh, end up thinking about taking your own life. Come to find out later on, when people started to deconstruct all of these arguments that these people made, you're actually less likely to contemplate suicide if you play a role-playing game. I'm not going to get into the whys or, or wherefores about it. We're not it. doctors. We're not, but that was what was found out at the end of the day. But there were a number of other things that, that took place um, kind of con tied into what uh, all of the efforts of Thomas Radeke and Pat Pulling, there were churches who would were t gathering up all the Dungeons and Dragons materials that belonged to the children of their parishioners. They would have bonfires in the middle of parking lots. They would drive bulldozers over the books. There was, but but the hysteria continued to grow. 
there was one instance of a woman saying that when she threw her son's Dungeons & Dragons materials into a, their fireplace to destroy them, that the books actually screamed. Um, Gary Gygax came out and said, if you can get somebody to make a book scream in a fireplace or by burning it, I'll pay you a million dollars. Of course, nobody <laughs> ever collected. But it was that kind of hysteria that really was going on in the 80s. And it's, it's, it's difficult for people who play the game now to look back and say, or to understand, that if you go back, there, you, if you played D&D, there was a good chance that you would be ostracized for playing it, or you needed to keep it under wraps when you were playing it. Um, there, was a, there were a couple of other uh, interesting situations that arose from people who ended up playing Dungeons & Dragons, but one of the things that I find most interesting about all this is that during this time period, the sales of Dungeons & Dragons from TSR skyrocketed. Um, and, Gee, who'd have thought? Yeah, you know, and there's a there's a really interesting uh, discussion about the Satanic Panic and how it affected TSR. Uh, it's on. It was done by Tim Cask. For those of you who don't know who Tim Cask is, he was the editor of the Dragon Magazine, basically from the day that the Dragon Magazine started all the way through till I don't know, probably four or five years later. I'm not exactly sure. He runs his own. YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Curmudgeon in the Cellar. I'll put a link to that. If you want to learn about old school Dungeons and Dragons, early days D&D and early days TSR stuff, he's the guy to go and watch. But I will also put a link to an interview that he did at GaryCon four or five years ago. Yeah, and that's an interesting watch. It, 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 where he discusses this mm -hmm. exactly. And he talks about how the police would show up at TSR with bulletin boards. And this was related to the Thomas Egbert situation. They showed up at TSR with his bulletin, with Thomas Egbert's bulletin board. Thomas Dallas Egbert's bulletin board, and he had put stick pins, he had placed stick pins inside of his cork board bulletin board, and they were concerned that it had some sort of occult significance, and they asked the folks at TSR to examine it and see if it had any relationship to the occult. Didn't. But you need to watch the, the interview by Tim Cask, but I'll put a link to that. It's really interesting stuff. He's an interesting fellow. Anyway, all these things were going on out there in the world, and Patricia Pulling was going gangbusters, trying to make sure that people knew that D&D &D was evil. Um, and we're going to go take a look, a closer look at this, this document that she was handing out to people. But one of the things, this is a quote from, or almost a quote, almost an exact quote from Pulling. She characterized the game as promoting demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, satanic type rituals, gambling, barbarism, cannibalism, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, divination, and other teachings. So Pat Poling believed that in some ways Dungeons and Dragons was responsible for a lot of the ills that young people were experiencing. For basically all of the evil in the world could be ascribed back to this. They really could. But let's take a look at this document that she would go, and she would she would travel the country um, talking, like I said, to police departments and talking to um, school districts and libraries. And there's there are some really interesting videos online where there are some individuals who claim to be former cult members who produced videos to give to um, police departments to help them spot the people who were involved in cult activities. And there's even a there are even a few lists out there of the questions that police officers were supposed to ask of young people whom they suspected might have played Dungeons and Dragons. And it was, there were these questions you could ask in order to find out if they played the game and were then therefore most likely responsible for bad activities that were happening in the police officer's precincts. That's scary stuff. But... Yeah, that's going down a dangerous road. It really is. Um, and again, modern day D&D, &D, you would not have thought that this was the situation. Not at all. Nope. Anyway, um, if you look here, you know, I can throw up the, the front page of this, of this document. And it is obviously made for educators, librarians, pastors, police, and parents. And it's divided up into, I'm not going to throw up each one of these pages, but they're in the contents section. There's a, there's a section on suicides. There's a section on banning D&D. There's a section on statements, which is just statements of people who knew someone who committed suicide that they think it was related to Dungeons and Dragons. It was actually Pat Pulling who believed it, not necessarily the people who made the statements. 
Um, there was spell preparation. There was D&D versus witchcraft in the occult. There was blood and human sacrifice in a section. There was the religious themes of D&D, &D, and there was negativism, and I'm not exactly sure what that is. And I'm not going to go through this page by page, Just I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. This was Pat Pulling's introduction. This pamphlet was prepared specifically to show the negative aspects and direction of the D&D books. With 6,500 teens committing suicide and over 50,000 attempts every year, we cannot afford to overlook a game, she puts that in quotes, that teaches witchcraft, Satan worship, and cult-like religion, not to mention specific suicide phrases. What will be found in this pamphlet can hardly be considered a healthy release for suppressed hostilities or of educational value. So that's how she opens it up. Then she goes into, and this, this one, these next two paragraphs are interesting to me. She states, We have now witnessed libraries and educators taking on a great liability by allowing the game to become part of the curriculum of their per curriculum or program. Who will take the blame for a suicide or mental problem evolving from the game? Who will be liable? Who is willing to lose a son or a daughter? This is the interesting part. This pamphlet is a condensed, in-depth, researched investigation it's not, designed to save educators and librarians hours of research and for them to reach a common sense decision. There's a lot of references in this to this being used as educational curriculum, which right. it's, I, I mean, I wasn't alive in the 1980s, right. but I don't think that was ever really the case. Were these ever even in the high school libraries, these books? I didn't, I don't know. Uh, I know that it was played in games. I don't know that the books were ever in school libraries, but I think that there were people, there were just some interested librarians. I know that back in the 80s, the game was being played to try and help shy kids have something that would help them get out of their... Which is great. Exactly. Um, I don't know, though, that you could go down and check out a DM's guide in, in any library across the country. I could be wrong on that. Um, there was a, there's a very interesting... Uh, a very interesting statement, I guess you will, related to our Instagram post. That some, someone put up something related to our Instagram post of this document. And mm -hmm. it just came in, um, I believe, today. And the individual said that when he was playing D&D &D in grade school, the local pastor down the street was waiting outside of the classroom to chastise the kids when they left the room mm. after playing D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And he handed out to them, after telling them that they were basically condemned to hell, he handed out something called the Chick Tracts. And there, there's a guy by the name of Chick, and I can't remember his first name. If you look up Chick Tracts, just like it's spelled C-H-I-C-K, he was a, a minister who created a bunch of comic books about the evils of D&D. &D. But and you can find some of those online. But And I'd love to get some actual copies of them. But... Um, Apparently, this young man or this man said that when he was a kid, uh, second, third grade, they played D and D. This guy showed up and started handing out these chick tracts, saying, "You're gonna, con you're condemned to hell if you play this game." Well, apparently, the parents of the children were not too happy about this, and they came in and sat down and played the game with the kids. Found out that it was really a pretty harmless game for second and third graders, and then they confronted the pastor when he tried to do this again the next time they mm -hmm. played, and things went from bad to worse. Eventually, the pastor was driven out of his church, apparently by his parishioners. But that was the kind of thing that people were doing at that time when they heard you were playing Dungeons and Dragons. It was a scourge. It really was. Uh, here's something. Here's a quote in that do in this um, bad document from Thomas Radicke. He is listed as. MD, psychiatrist at the University of Illinois School of Medicine, which apparently he was not. Um, he stated this in a national seminar on violence, that every Dungeons & Dragons game he has seen features a theme of armed violence and role-playing situations. He pointed out the uh, suicide of Patricia Pulling's son as one of the illustrations. Uh, then there was a bunch of just statements that they took out of context and dropped in here to try and reinforce their point. One of them, uh, sister of Harold T. Collins, uh, referring to her brother, she said, we played the game with him, but we stopped when we walked, when he walked about the house in his evil character, and he became hostile if we joked about D&D. &D. He told us if we did not stop joking, he would call down a bolt of lightning to kill us. 
Gotta say, I've seen your brother when he was a little guy walk around saying, if you don't knock it off, I am going to cause a lightning bolt or an earthquake or whatever. I've seen him walk around now. Exactly. Like you know, I, so uh, there's another interesting quote here. This is by Dr. Gary North, author of None Dare Call It Witchcraft. He stated, these games are the most magnificently packaged, most profitably marketed, most thoroughly researched introductions to the occult in man's recorded history. I'm sure TSR would have loved to know oh, yeah. that they had the best package. That they were so successful. Right. The rest of this pamphlet spends a lot, since, uh, actually the majority of the pamphlet just goes to making a comparison between select quotes out of books by people who were against the occult or afraid of the occult, and they compared quotes from those documents to uh, paragraphs out of the Dungeon Master's Guide or the Player's Handbook of AD&D. Um, none of the, most of it was from, the, most of the quotes they compared, say, the Player's Handbook to were out of Reader's Digest, things like that. Uh, but then we get to the special center section of the document where she discusses blood and human sacrifice, graveyard desecration, missing children, Satan worship, and witchcraft. Question mark, question mark, exclamation point, exclamation point, and, and I think, And I think that I probably would have finished that one off with blood and human sacrifice as possibly being the most important subject. Yes, that might be the most important thing. But uh, witchcraft ended up being kind of re receiving yeah, pride of place yeah. in that particular thing. But anyway, she, she goes in and talks about various spells from the Player's Handbook from AD&D and what, they, what you could supposedly do with them. There was another interesting quote I came across a couple years ago where there were some people who claimed that they had watched as their son had summoned a demon in his bedroom using the D&D materials to do so. And then immediately after the demon appeared, he took his own life. And my first thought was... If you, if you or your brother had, ma number one, managed to summon a demon using the player's handbook, on one hand, I would have been kind of impressed by that. Yeah. But I would never have let you finish that particular ritual <laughs> if it looked like it was going to actually if happen. The, 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 it started glowing red on the floor. Exactly. And, yeah. and then a big fire as appears or something. Crawling I would it, yeah. have put a stop to mm -hmm. that. So uh, there, there are a lot of people, as, as in any one of these situa any situation similar to this, you're going to get a lot of people who are going to jump on the bandwagon and claim that they saw or yeah. support the, the, the most, most outlandish thing that they can possibly support just because it's going to bring them attention. That had to have been one of, the, one of those situations. And these lists of spells and whatnot that she's put in here, it, it's, they're literally just taken out of the books and yeah. placed in, like, this spell does this, which is why in not just this situation but all situations context is very very important right. for understanding what you're talking about and what it was intended to mean like yes these spells do this but it's not for use in real life it's for use in the game but there are there are just no end of these there are page after page after of there's of, what 44 pages long? at least mm -hmm. and i would say probably 30 of them are just comparisons of what's stated in the dm's guide in the player's handbook to people who didn't like the occult in reader's digest yeah uh, then she gets into statements about n the negativity involved in D&D. &D. She quotes Gary Gygax from the Dungeon Master's Guide, page 8. As this book is the exclusive precinct of the Dungeon Master, you must view any non-player possessing it as something less than worthy of honorable death. I'm not even going to... I'm just going yeah, just... to... Um, Dungeon Master's Guide regarding death. The character faces death in many forms. The most common death due to combat is no greater matter in most cases, for the character can often be brought back to wish, be brought back by means of a clerical spell or an alter reality wish. Yeah. Again, rules. Literally, just rules. Rules of a game. Just, I, I, rules of a game. I, I throw yeah. my hands up. So to finish this off, this document off, because again, it's there's so much that I don't want to belabor the point. But she finishes this with by saying, the healthy growth and development of our children is being hindered by violent fantasy role-playing games, rock music, which directs the kids to get high, shoot up, commit suicide, and Satan worship, pornographic literature, violent movies, and lastly, violent videos. What can be found in these things that builds character, integrity, and high ideals? So again, I'm, and this is again, this is by bad bothered about Dungeons and Dragons, but again, I can I can understand how 
if you if you thought that there was something going on that would be threatening to your child, you would want to find a way to put a stop to it. But once you get to the point where this is how you're making your living, right. that's where it becomes problematic for me. And that's the problem I have with this. If if she had voiced her opinion and said, you know, I worry about what this game might be doing to some people. It was the fact that she went out and started to pull all kinds of basically incorrect well, not basically, completely incorrect information yeah. and started to manufacture facts in order to push her point. To me, that's where she crossed the line. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, but when you start making things up to the detriment of others, that's when it gets to be bad. No pun intended. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, that's Patricia pulling in bad. Now, Dr. Thomas Radeke, one of her allies, uh, to give you some idea, again, we're talking context here, to give you some idea of the people she allied herself with, uh, Thomas Radeke was not a doctor on the staff of Illinois. I think it was Illinois State University. I guess what it's um, he was an adjunct professor who was a, basically he was just allowed to use their facility for some of his for, for some of his some of his work. But I have to say, in 2016, I believe it was Dr. Thomas Radeke was convicted and sentenced to prison for uh, 10, 12 years because he took to taking prescription drugs and trading them to his psychiatric patients for sex, and he was caught. And the, apparently the sheriff of the county in which he lived claims that the drug problem that he started for prescription drugs, it, they're still trying to take care of it for, well, at the time it was 2020. Uh, they're still trying to sort that out four years later. But this is the kind of person that Thomas Radeke was, not the best of allies. And there are a, no, there are a number of other um, people that she, she uh, got to support her, her views on things that ended up kind of the same way. Now... The, um, there was a man, and I cannot remember his name, I will put it up on the screen, who published something called The Pulling Report, where yeah. and he was a fiction writer, and I want to say he also did occasional investigative reporting, but I'm not sure. He took Pat Pulling's and Bad's uh, arguments and the uh, arguments of Thomas Radeke, he took those and just dissected them piece by piece to show how bad they were, and that's freely available yeah. online. How bad they were. I keep coming back to that. It must be a subconscious thing. Uh, but it's an interesting read to see how far um, Pat Pulling and Bad ended up going in order to reinforce their opinions in front of police departments and libraries and so on. But that was that was the that was the violent, uh, or not the violent, but that was the response of of a lot of people to Dungeons and Dragons back in the 1980s. Was it as bad as season four of um, Stranger Things? I don't know of any instances where anybody was chasing people down trying to kill them because it's they played the game. Definitely. That's definitely. I'm not, I'm not faulting the, the uh, director and the, the writers of Stranger Things for doing that. I think it's really interesting what they the way they they threaded that into the into the story. But this was something that you had to be careful about. There, I mean, I personally never experienced it. I was in my tw early twenties mm -hmm. at the time, and so I really didn't feel a lot of the impact of it. I remember reading about it in the newspaper. I remember a lot of the, uh, what I realized at the time were absolutely outlandish claims that were being made about Dungeons and Dragons, but it didn't really affect me personally. But I know a lot of people who were affected by it personally. Uh, the, the individual who responded to our Instagram post yeah. being one, but there are other people who, who also, and I think that this is the sad part to me, is that back in those days, one of the reasons that a lot of people gravitated to D&D &D was because they were shy, they were intelligent, and they were creative. And I think that's still the case today. I, I think it is. I think, but back then it was really, you know, that, that yeah, was yeah, really yeah. a major reason why so mm -hmm. many people, so many of the people who went to it went to it. Yeah. And so people who um, may not have been able to make friends easily or may not have had many friends, they often found their friendships by playing Dungeons and Dragons. They gravitated toward other people of like mind. And the efforts of Patricia pulling, that's what makes me angry about her, yeah. is that she ostracized those kids again who through, already through may this, have been ostracized. Through this yeah. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. were, they, maybe they had been able to find a way to get away from that ostrac ostracization and Patricia Pulling tried to get them right back into it again. And that's yeah. the thing that troubles me the most about yeah. the D&D Satanic Panic. Uh, interesting side note, uh, just before I retired, there were uh, we had some 30-somethings that played D&D &D down where I worked. Oh, yeah, he's retired. Also, set off the balloons. Yeah. Um, but one of my last months there, 
they I, I overheard a conversation where there was, you know, hey, what are you going to do this weekend? Oh, we're, we're, we're getting together with so-and-so, and we're going to be playing Dungeons and & Dragons. And I couldn't help but think, if this had been 1984, you would not be having that conversation here where I were at the place that I work. You would not be having that conversation. Yes. Um, so things have changed. Um, you know, eventually Dungeons and Dragons kind of slipped by the wayside, and then it was overtaken, I think, more by video games. I think music continued to be a problem for people like uh, the Bad or organizations like Bad. Uh, for a long period of time, but eventually D and D just kind of people lost interest in it being this mm -hmm. this font of evil, and they ended up uh, moving on to other other subjects. But yeah, interesting stuff, interesting bit of D and D history. We'll put those links, like I said, to Tim Cask's uh, videos on here. And then if you're interested, just Google Dungeons and Dragons Satanic Panic. There's You'll be amazed at how much information there is. Unbelievable amount, yeah. And you can also see there was a really interesting uh, debate on a uh, television program called 60 Minutes, which is still on. Uh, it was all about Dungeons and Dragons. You may and, have heard of it. <laughs> it was all about Dungeons and Dragons. And they had Pat Pulling on, they had Gary Gygax on. Gary Gygax was essentially ambushed. He thought he was just going on the show to talk about DD. No, he was going, he was ambushed about it being something that was related to the occult. Uh, but it's an interesting watch. And it's one of the worst, as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the worst editions of 60 Minutes that was ever produced. Uh, because they decided that they wanted to push Pat Patricia Pulling's side of the argument from the get-go, and that's exactly what they did through editing and everything else. But it's interesting to go yeah. and see that. But yeah, a lot of information out there about it. But I guess one of the things I want to make sure is that this kind of thing doesn't end up happening again. No. I thought you, thought you would find this interesting, especially in light of what's going on with Stranger Things. We realize we're a little bit late, but if you haven't watched it yet, go check it out. Anyway, I'm Jim. I'm Alex. Keep your sword on free. Bye-bye.